This is a short video, part two, of a video on limits. And so now I'm about to tell you about what does it mean to say that the limit of a function at a point C is equal to some number L. So what we'll start off with is say you've got a subset of the real line A. Let's say C is a cluster point of A. That was from the last video. Let's say I've got a function that whose domain is A and it spits out real numbers. So we will say that a real number L is the limit of F at C if the following happens. So here is the formal definition of a limit of a function that we need to know. For every epsilon that's positive, there should exist a positive number delta such that if X is in the domain of this function here, and if X is within delta of C, the cluster point, right? And moreover, this is trying to say that I don't actually care that X, like I'm just gonna specify that X cannot be equal to C either. I don't care that, uh, I don't need my function f to be defined at c is maybe another way to think about that. But uh, if the x's are that close to c, then it should happen that the outputs of the function at x should be within epsilon of L. And in the case that this bluish definition satisfied, we'd use the usual notation limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to L. And I think I've got some notes for you so far, as far as this blue definition goes. And what the rest of this video is, is trying to make sense of this blue definition. So first thing is that well, F not be, need not be defined at C. And this number L, this number L here, it need not be in the range of F. So I'm not saying that L should be equal to like F of, F of C necessarily, right? So uh, well, that's a later concept called continuity, which I'm sure you've heard of before. And uh, what else do I want to tell you? Part two, when you read this blue definition, for every epsilon, we should be able to find a delta. So this delta should depend on epsilon. And what we'll also see too is that it's okay if delta depends on what C is here in this case. But the point is that epsilon should be arbitrary, whereas delta should be something that we can do some work to find. Okay, so first thing we should do is Make sure that uh, if a function has a limit, and it only has one limit. If a function has a limit at a point, there's only one of them. And so how would you prove this? So let's suppose that there's two, now, there's two numbers, two real numbers, L and L prime, that both satisfy this blue epsilon delta definition of a limit up here. So what we're gonna try to do is show that L and L prime are actually equal, therefore, there's only one limit, we'll call it L. So how would we do that? So let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. So if L and L prime both satisfy that epsilon delta definition, right? Uh, what does that say? That tells me that, well, I could find some number delta one such that if X is in A and uh, X is within delta one of C, then the output F of X should be within, I could say epsilon over two of L. And I can apply the same thing because L prime satisfies the epsilon uh, delta definition of a limit. So similarly, if I want to make sure that uh, f of x is within epsilon over 2 of L prime now, I could find some delta 2 that makes sure that happened because, again, L prime satisfies that definition up there. So similarly, there exists a delta 2 such that if x is in A and if x is within delta 2 of C, then f of x should be within epsilon over 2 of L prime. Now what we're going to do is we are going to tie L and L prime together. And so what else I'll do, I'm going to make delta be smaller of delta 1 and delta 2. And why would I do that? Because that makes sure that uh, f of x is simultaneously within epsilon over 2 of L and that f of x is within epsilon over 2 of L prime. And so in that case, what would I have? So if x is in A, and again, if X is within delta of this cluster point C, then L minus L prime, I'm gonna do my, my old trick where I add and subtract the same thing inside right here, F of X minus F of X. And then I'll use the triangle inequality to split that up because I know what I can say about the distance between L and F of X. And I also know what I can say about the distance between L prime and F of X. I know those are both less than epsilon over two of each other. And therefore when I add them together, it's less than epsilon. So since L minus L prime can always be made less than epsilon, we'll wait for any epsilon, right? Epsilon was arbitrary. There was no specific way that I picked it in the beginning. Therefore conclude that L is actually equal to L prime. If they can be made arbitrarily close to each other, that means that they are equal to each other. So another way to think about limits, and I think I've got some pictures for you, to say that uh, the limit of f as x approaches c is l, that's the same thing as saying the following. So for any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero, such that if x is in that delta neighborhood of c and in a, 
So in other words, it's in the domain of the function is what I'm trying to say, but it's also within delta of C. That's what the V notation is. Then F of X should be in this epsilon neighborhood of L. So here, I'm gonna give you two ways to think about it. I'm gonna to try to draw you the picture in one dimension, right? Where here's the domain on the real line. I'm saying, here's a cluster point C. And like, what does F do? F transforms this little subset into something new. And so here's another copy of the real line. And so what I wanna think about then, how should I look at this? How should I start? I'm gonna start over here. I should be able to put any little window around L that I like of any length epsilon that, sh that anybody would give you. What we should be able to do is the following. We should be able to look backwards and find a little interval around C so that everything gets sent inside of that window. The output of everything by your function should land back in there. So again, we're gonna start here for any window you put around L, we should be able to find a window back here where every output gets sent inside of there. And so I think that's my next picture. So given that green window around L, I should be able to find some purple window back here so that for every X in that window, F of X lands inside of this interval from L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. So here's a 2D picture, which in my opinion is a little bit more intuitive, but I'll try to do the same kind of thing. If I had the graph of my function, which is there in white, again, where am I gonna start at? And I've also drawn for you the domain A down there. For any epsilon window you put around this number L here, and in my picture, L definitely looks like it's an output of that function, say, so that's fine. But like the concept of a limit makes sense if there was a hole in the graph there. Like the limit as X approaches C would still be L. Anyway though, so for any little window you put around L, what should we be able to do? Well, we should be able to look back in the domain and find values, find a window around C so that every uh, F sends everything, every output back into this window. So maybe that was confusing. So what do I wanna say here? I should be able to find some little window around C of radius delta in that case, so that if you were to take any X like this guy, plug him into your function, well, where's his Y value? His Y value lands inside of that green window. So no matter how, how tight this green window is, we should be able to always find a corresponding purple window here. And I hope that you see for any arbitrary window up here, there exists a window down here. Epsilon's arbitrary, there exists a delta corresponding to that epsilon. So that is what I really want my pictures to say to you. So let's do some examples about how you use that definition beyond maybe more concrete cases. So what if you had say a constant function, remember, this notation means that uh, the value of the function is always equal to b, so for every single x and r. What we wanna do is improve that, well, the limit as x approaches c is just b. So I'll try to do in green, what's the thought process here? So we wanna find a delta such that if x is within c of delta, then f of x is within epsilon of b. I think I said the first part wrong. If x is within delta of c, then f of x is within epsilon of b. And what you'll typically do should seem kind of familiar to sequences, limits of sequences. Start here and kind of work backwards. So all this stuff I'm gonna do in green is like scratch work. So well, what is this? f of x is actually equal to b. Well, that's pretty cool. So when I plug that in, um, what would that be? That would be, that should be a b minus b there, which is equal to zero. So, well, I mean, epsilon's supposed to be bigger than zero. So therefore, epsilon's always bigger than this, and that's pretty awesome. So in fact, any delta will do. So what's the formal proof look like? And here's a picture, by the way. If I was to put any window that I like around here, we could put any window we want around here because all these outputs have the same Y value, which importantly, land inside of that interval. That's what I'm trying to say. So I don't care how big of a window you actually put around C, any delta works. So what would the proof look like? Let epsilon be bigger than zero. Choose any delta you want. Let's choose delta equals one, just randomly, it doesn't matter. Same proof would work if you choose delta equal to a million. So that uh, if x is within one of c, then f of x minus b, their distance between those two numbers, that's just b minus b, which is zero, which again, well, epsilon's bigger than that. So that finishes it. So those outputs are always within epsilon of each other. So let's do a slightly more complicated one. The limit at x approaches c of the function x should be equal to c. So let's kind of work in green again. What's the scratch work look like? So what do we want? We want to find a delta so that if x is within c of delta, then f of x is within uh, epsilon of c. I think I said the first part wrong again, but I think you knew what I meant. What we'll do is we'll start there. What is f of x? Well, f of x is just the function x here. So x minus c 
should be less than epsilon. I want that to happen. Well, wait a minute. Why don't, why don't I just make delta equal to epsilon? So that in that case, what am I trying to say to you here? If I was to put any window around C here, the limit value, right? Then why don't I just put the same window around C down here since this is the function Y equals X? Because this output then, where does its Y value land? It lands inside of that window. That's what this is trying to say. And so what's the formal proof look like? Let epsilon be bigger than zero. Choose delta equal to epsilon so that if x is within delta of c, oh, I said it right that time, then f of x minus c, what's it equal to? It's x minus c. And uh, wait a minute, if uh, x minus c is less than delta, but delta equals epsilon, well then this, you guessed it, it's less than epsilon. Let's do one more, the hardest one. So the limit as x approaches c of x squared should be c squared. So what do we want? Same setup, hope you see how these are the same. I wanna find a delta, so that if x minus c is uh, less than delta, the absolute value there, then f of x should be within epsilon of the limit, c squared. So maybe what we'll do is, like usual, we'll start there, and notice f of x, in this case, is x squared. So x squared minus c squared, if you factor that, remember that's x plus c, x minus c, and when you're multiplying two things in absolute value, you can split it up and see the product of the absolute values. But now, what do I have? I mean, I want this to be, I wanna find a delta so that when, uh, when x minus c is smaller than delta, then this should be less than epsilon. And I'm pretty excited because there's an x minus c here, but there's this extra x plus c here. And I want that to be less than epsilon, but I've got some work to do. So what should we make this x plus c in absolute value be less than? And what you wanna be careful is delta. Delta here, he can depend on epsilon, and he's also allowed to depend on c, but what it's not allowed to do, it's not allowed to depend on any other x within that little interval. So in particular, what might be enticing, you're just thinking like, well, why don't I just divide this over to this side, right? Then I've got x minus c is less than something, and that could be my delta. What I'm trying to say, though, is there's too much going on here. That delta cannot depend on what the x in your interval is. It has to depend on these two fixed things, perhaps, epsilon and what you're actually approaching. So what are we gonna do? What we're gonna do is, if x minus c is supposed to be, it's probably gonna be pretty small, right? And, and maybe the smaller I make it, maybe the better off that I am. So why don't we say, first of all, let's see what happens when x is within one of c. Because that'll tell me some information about how bad x plus c is an absolute value. So then the absolute value of x plus c, I'll do my trick where I'll add and subtract c inside, and I'll use the triangle inequality to split that up, because now, if I assume that x is just within one of c, say, then this should be less than one plus two absolute value of c. And so what have we done? We've created a kind of an upper bound for this that doesn't depend on what x is at all right now. Like if I assume that x is that close to c, then I can always say that x plus c the distance from x to minus c, I guess, is uh, always less than one plus two absolute value of c. So why should that be useful to me? If I wanna make this less than epsilon, instead, why don't I make this less than epsilon? Because what would happen then, when I divide by one plus two absolute value of c now on both sides, then now I've got x minus c could be less than, uh, maybe I should just finish it, less than this number, which is good because that doesn't depend on what x actually is. I don't see an x in that formula is what I'm trying to get at. All right, so then that's true again, if and only if when you divide both sides, this would be a good delta. So again, how did we make sure that that happened? Well, that was in the case that uh, x is already at, at least, yeah, at least, is that what I wanna say? Maybe at most within one of c, right? And we're okay if we make it smaller. So why don't we let delta just be the smaller of the following two, one and epsilon over one plus two c. So if delta is the smaller of the two, then all this good stuff happens. So what's the formal proof look like here? So we just kind of did all of our scratch work. Let epsilon be positive, choose delta to be the smaller of one and epsilon over one plus two absolute value of C. Then if X is within that delta of C, what happens? Well, the distance between F of X and C squared is the same thing as the distance between X squared and C squared. Do your factoring trick. And then now what we could say is I remember that uh, this is less than one plus two C. And also I assume that this is less than Delta and my Delta is the smaller of these two here. In that case, it's definitely smaller than this piece of it. And so the point now is that you see 
there's some cancellation that happens and what are you left with? It's just the outputs, the output and C squared are within epsilon of each other. And so that finishes that the limit of X squared as X approaches C is C squared.